Hi, I'm Elizabeth Curry Chandler, and this is Books of Your Life. Support for Books of Your Life comes from Audible. Enjoy audiobooks anytime, anywhere with the free Audible app. Your first book is free when you start a 30-day trial. So, why not check it out? Visit audible.com slash goodreads or text goodreads to 500-500. Butterfly in the sky, I can go twice as high. If you love reading and grew up in the 80s or 90s, LeVar Burton might be one of the reasons why. He hosted Reading Rainbow on PBS for 23 years and was executive producer as well. Today, LeVar has a popular storytelling podcast, LeVar Burton Reads, and his company has kept the spirit of Reading Rainbow alive with an app and digital book library called Skybrary. LeVar is also legendary for playing Geordi LaForge, the blind spaceship engineer with that famous visor on Star Trek The Next Generation. And, of course, he first found fame playing Kunta Kinte in the 1977 miniseries Roots. Here's my conversation with LeVar Burton that we recorded last month in a studio in Los Angeles. Hi, LeVar. I'm so excited to speak with you. Elizabeth, it's my pleasure to be here. This, I mean, this is really, this is cool because there are few names in literature today that are more respected than that of Goodreads. Oh, that makes me <laughs> get a little emotional. It's true, though. Yeah. I mean, that's my opinion. Thank you. Um, well, I have to say, like many in my generation, I was a rabid mm. Reading Rainbow Consumer, <laughs> and Yay. I used to fantasize about someday being one of those kids that got to do their little book report mm -hmm. on your mm -hmm. show. Mm -hmm. The book reviews, yeah. Yeah, which I guess is foreshadowing for Goodreads. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, you know, we're here to talk about books. Let's do. And I have been asking everyone I'm interviewing mm -hmm. about the books that have changed their lives. Right, right. And you had a really interesting list. Yeah, and then uh, I scrapped that list. What? <laughs> well, I mean, not scrapped it, but I mean, I, I thought about it again. And I thought, you know what? There's a book that I'm leaving off this list um, unintentionally that more than any other book has really shaped the course and trajectory of my life. And no other piece of literature I've ever read has reaffirmed who I am and why I'm here more than Roots by Alex Haley. Okay. So the other books are books that have shaped my perception, my perspective, and my point of view, but there's not a book that embodies who I am more than that novel. And which makes sense, too, because then you played the role. I played the role of Kunta Kinte. I feel like I have a very um, elemental connection to that character and, and his journey, and I just I feel that... That story, that multi-generational story of, of triumph and survival against the most dire of circumstances is intrinsically my story and the story of my family. And it's such an important part of my life, that novel. It's given me the life that I now lead, that novel. Um, so it, it, it is the fundamentally most influential book I've ever read. Do you read it again? I have read it three times now over the course of the last, what, 42 years? Hmm. Yeah. And it, did it say different things it to does. you? It does, every time. And then the things that it says that are memorable are even more indelibly um, etched. It's, yeah. in, it's interesting to read a book at oh, different God. phases yeah. in your of life. Of your life, absolutely. Yeah. It even makes me think about one of the other books that you mentioned, mm -hmm. a book that changed your perspective. That changed my perspective. A and you said The Road Less Traveled, A New Psychology of Love, Traditional Values, and Spiritual Growth by Scott Peck. M. Scott Peck, M.D., yeah. I read that book for the first time when I was in my late 20s, early 30s. Um, it was a time when I was really trying to figure a lot of things out. And the information in that book uh, and, and the idea that personal responsibility uh, and accountability, nothing can substitute for that. In, if, you're, if you are what I consider to be a serious human being, that is a, a person who is really striving to maximize their potential in life, deliver the gift that they were meant to deliver, um, 
make a contribution and get the hell out. <laughs> 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 that, that, that's my plan, and, and I'm sticking to it. So when I read that book, and it, it introduced to me the idea that personal accountability was key to being a, a, a realized human being, um, I decided to become all about it, you know. Yeah, it, it was fascinating to me how he so clearly defined it, too, mm. in, in such an eloquent way about how neurotics think that everything is wrong with them. Mm -hmm. And then people with a character disorder think the world is at fault for their problems. Right. And then he talks about all the repercussions of that kind of mentality. And, and, and the behavior that happens as a result of that kind of mentality. And we see it all around us, right? Um, we see it every day, all around us. And... Um, and so that was a that was a, a a book that I will point to at a particular part of my journey where I was really looking for answers to some of life's mysteries, right? Did you feel like before then you were blaming the outside world for your problems? <sighs> sure, I imagine I imagine that was a big part of it. That was a big part of my point of view. But I was young, you yeah. know, and uh, d didn't know much better. Um, it seemed like a reasonable <laughs> way to live my life until I discovered that it wasn't, you know? I liked how he talked about embracing pain. Yes. And being able to do that and be able to be so honest right. about that life can be painful and making decisions that are good for you are often painful. I uh, One of the phrases that, that, that I really embraced as a result of reading that book was I, 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 I now tend to believe that pain is a necessary part of growth in life. Suffering is something different. That's a little bit indulgent. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, uh, depending upon the circumstances, right? I mean, there are some circumstances for which suffering is the only and the and and the most appropriate response. But normally, when we're talking about choice, we can choose to deal with pain, or we can, you know, throw ourselves a pity party and suffer our way through it. Yeah. Right. That's interesting, because, yeah, when you choose the pity party, <laughs> yeah. you are choosing kind of to suffer. Aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know I am when yeah. I do. That's... No, it's true. It's true. It's true. I mean, I, I read this book, and I thought, oh, I'm doing some of the, you know, it, everybody's human, and we're all doing yes. these things at different moments, right. and it's such a good reminder. Yeah. And, and that the, the road less traveled really is the most desired pathway. Yeah. But it's not, it's going to take work. Right. But the work pays off inevitably every time without fail. You invest the time in doing the work. The work pays off. Yeah. Let's talk about a couple of the books that changed your life. OK. The first one that you listed was Captain Courageous Cap by Rudyard yeah. Kipling. Yeah. Right. So how did you find that book? Oh, that I read Tell that me book. The discovery story. So I read that book for the first time when I was in the third grade. Um, and that is the book that I cite um, as the experience I was having when I got what reading was, when the light bulb went on, right? When that fire got into, like, wow, we've got, <laughs> Houston, we've got a flame here, right? There's a burning inferno in this kid's chest. Um, I remember distinctly having been so engrossed in the story and the characters and the narrative that I got very sad when I finished the book. Now, as a response, when I'm reading a particularly good piece of fiction, I slow down the last chapter because I'm just trying to forestall that inevitable, you know, little dip of depression that I experience when I'm leaving a world that I've become really attached to. So that's why I cite Captain's Courageous by Rudyard Kipling as one of the three books that really changed my life because it did. It, 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 it turned me from a kid who knew how to read into a reader for life. So then let's talk about the second book that you mentioned, mm -hmm. which was The Autobiography of a Yogi by mm -hmm. Paramhansa Yogananda. Paramhansa Yogananda. Thank you. Paramhansa Yogananda. It's about an acclaimed yogi as he encounters saints and sages mm -hmm, throughout mm -hmm. his life. He searches for a teacher, trains with a master, mm -hmm. and then goes to America and teaches. Mm -hmm. So how'd you find this book? Oh, it was just one of those books that was around, you know. 
<laughs> if 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 you're of a certain age and you lived through the harmonic convergence and live aid and i mean there's just a, a period of hist a period of of social history recent social history in america where the self-help movement was at the forefront of societal evolution right uh with uh, tony robbins and yoga and you know uh, maximizing human potential it became a movement in this country right um and you know i've i've always been the sort of person to um consciously willfully expose myself to as much as i could and then absorb that which works for me and sort of leave the rest behind and um and so i've just sampled a lot of different things, yoga, meditation. And so in, you, you move in these circles and there are pieces of literature that come along with those subcultures, right? And, and the autobiography of a yogi is, is one of those books. So at the time, were you doing a lot of yoga? And yeah, I was. I was doing a lot of yeah. yoga. I was, we were shooting, uh, I, read, uh, I read this book for the first time in 1989. So we had been shooting Star Trek The Next Generation for a couple of years. Um, my life had settled into a real beautiful routine. I had a steady job for the first time in my life as an actor. I'd been, you know, doing it for a couple of decades, and it was my first steady job. So I was, I was in a really good place and felt that it was appropriate to um, continue that curiosity that I've always had for discovering um, how to best do this thing called life. And um, so we used to do yoga on the bridge of the Enterprise at lunchtime. and uh, Everybody? Was, well, no, just a, a, a small group of us. Uh -huh. But I would bring my yoga teacher, Siri Dharma, in, and, and she would conduct a class for anybody who wanted one, and we'd find an empty set. It was always cool when the empty set on that day was the bridge because doing <laughs> yoga on the bridge of the enterprise always amazing. felt to me like an amazing thing to be doing and and i we really enjoyed that and you know just dipping my toe in all sorts of different modalities that um helped reaffirm who i am and and what i was looking for things like rolfing rebirthing um jumping out of an airplane uh fire walking with tony robbins those, you know those those um challenges that um, that cause us to remember who we are. Yeah. Right. And and so, you read this book, and did yeah. it did it change anything in particular, or what? Or does this sort of embody just that moment in your life? It reaffirmed for for me once again. It was a it was a it was a sensation of reaffirmation that you know what. Even though you're making this up as you're going along, uh, you're not far off. You're 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 pretty much on the beam, kid. Keep going, keep going. Amazing, right? I I loved a couple of things that were said in this book. Mm. One thing I think is particularly timely is he writes, "God is simple. Everything else is complex. Do not seek absolute values in the relative world of nature." Mm. Mm-hmm. And I just thought that was so powerful right now where we have so many people who have such absolute views. Mm -hmm. There's so much wisdom in the pages of this book. And for me, it was, I mean, I, I grew up in a religious tradition. Um, I was raised Catholic, uh, studied for the Catholic priesthood for four years earlier in my life. Decided not to become a priest, to become an actor uh, instead. And have really been, part of my journey has been to reconcile my belief system around the idea of God hmm. and really arrive at a place that I'm comfortable in in respect to that belief in in God well, and that book was really it was it really helped it helped it helped reaffirm what I thought I believed yeah yeah I mean, I noticed that. I read about how you were in the seminary. Mm. And then I noticed with all these books that you recommended, yeah. they're about people seeking yeah, they things. Are. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you have it. Uh, I'm pretty transparent, as it turns out. <laughs> uh, bingo. I guess the interview's over now, huh? <laughs> we can all go home. <laughs> no, but I, I was like... 
this guy, you know, I, I thought it was beautiful, though. It was a lot. There's a lot of seeking in these books. It's about yeah. people seeking, yeah. you know, light yeah. and clarity yeah. Yeah. and, yeah. you know, control over their own decisions. Yeah. And right. even, you know, you're on a voyage in, on the sea in right. the Captain yeah. Courageous. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it was a journey of discovery, wasn't it? It's a journey of self-discovery. Yeah. yeah. So the the third book that right, you recommended, right, right. Um, the teachings of Don, of Don Juan, Juan by yeah. Carlos Castaneda. Castaneda. Yeah. yeah. Um, he's also seeking, but he also does a lot of substances. Journeying. 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 Yeah. Okay. Journeying. Yeah. yeah. Versus Conscious journeying. Yeah. Versus the yogi. Yes. Who who doesn't? So we have our our hero, our protagonist, uh, who establishes a relationship with uh, a brujo, an Indian um, shaman, who has power. And our protagonist wants power, wants to learn how to produce power and wield power. Um, and you know how you feel like you've, you've lived before, you've had a previous lifetime or, or two. And I've, I, I recognize that there's a part of me that has been very comfortable, perhaps in, in many lifetimes before, um, wearing a collar being part of a, a monastic or priestly order, living outside of community and, and, and doing the monastic life. Like I said, I studied for the priesthood earlier in this lifetime, and I, I, I could easily have followed that path. I identified in my early 30s that the real challenge for me in this lifetime is to be what I consider to be a spiritual warrior who lives in the world, right? And so I guess how it's worked out is I've, I've looked for, searched for um, signposts, um, confirmations along the way that help me reaffirm the very specific nature of the duality of my journey, wanting to have a spiritual center to my life, yet living very fully in the world, which means dealing with human beings and conflict and emotions and conflict and did I mention conflict and human <laughs> beings um, yeah. so the books that that I cited in this exercise are some of the books that really have been those milestone markers for me so tell me about this one the Don Juan where was that where were you uh, in high your school life? high school high school that was that was <laughs> right as I was making the decision to not become a priest and to become an actor right I was at St. Pius the 10th seminary in, in Northern California, in Galt, California. And I had decided not to become a priest. And I was looking around for what I was going to spend my time, efforts, and energy on. And that ended up being theater arts. And this was a time of, of real, um, I mean, I was really reevaluating everything I thought I knew. I was, you know, walking away from a, a Catholic, very Catholic, very parochial point of view and walking literally out into the world, leaving the confines of, of Northern California, Sacramento, California, and this, this small cloistered community in Galt in the middle of nowhere, farmland, Galt, California, like, you know, between Sacramento and Stockton, eight miles from Lodi. I, Remember the Creedence yes. song, Stuck in Lodi? <laughs> I was stuck in Galt for, for four years. Is... I never even made it to Lodi, okay? <laughs> And I literally left there and moved to Southern California with a full scholarship to study theater at the University of Southern California here. So I really stepped out into the world, right, from a pretty protected, cloistered environment and navigating these different environments, navigating them successfully has, has become a real important thing in my life. So after reading, so you had already decided you were going to leave the yeah. church when you read this, yeah. And it just solidified it, or was there? I just no, you know in, what? In I'm the a, words of Parliament, Funkadelic, it blew the roof off the sucker. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm going to read a very serious quote after that. So, but I just liked it about you know, for me, there's only the traveling on paths that have heart, mm -hmm. on any path that may have heart. And the only worthwhile challenge is to traverse its full length. And there I travel looking breathlessly. Mm. And he said, he asks, does this path have a heart? Mm. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's a great question. It is that a we great can... question to, that, that we all need to be able to ask ourselves honestly at, 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 at various points along uh, uh, our way. Um, I'm, 
you know, as I struggle with the the polarity in, in society today here in America, and I'm I'm really trying to figure out how to navigate my way through this um, with my sanity and dignity intact. Um, it occurs to me um, that we are none of us born evil. We are all capable of committing horrifically horrible acts, right? But those are choices that we make, generally to serve our own self-interest. But there are, I believe the truth lives somewhere in all of us and that we encounter the truth, the real truth about things at various points in our lives, even if we are continually acting in our own best interests and, and necessarily um, discounting and even disparaging the lives of others. And it occurs to me that I need to look more through that lens, that we're all capable of really good stuff and we're all capable of really, really dumb stuff and we're all capable of just really, really bad shit. And, and we just have to accept that in one another. Now, having said that, we're also in a conversation in this culture about the nature of truth itself. And yeah. that's where that's that's where it's very difficult for me to navigate. That's where I, I start, you know, um, feeling that the f I'm, I'm on unsure footing. There's sand underneath my feet. Because if, if I'm willing to suspend my belief that you're an asshole just because you think polar opposite to the way I do, if I'm willing to suspend that, that belief and and try and meet you in some middle ground the basque mystic i think it's she's quoting rumi uh, angelus arian when she says out beyond the ideas of right doing and wrong doing there is a field yeah i'll meet you there right i think that there there is a field where we can all meet but we have to suspend this you know this predetermined belief about one another but we have to if we're going to meet in that field, we have to agree on what the truth is, right? I just, I don't know, I, I try and think that everyone has something good to offer, you know? I try yeah. to come at every situation that way, and sometimes maybe I feel like people aren't even coming at situations well, here, with that point of view. Well, here's, here's, back to Roots for just a second. Yeah. I believe that Roots was, was a moment in American culture where we all recognized together we were all in agreement about what the truth was, okay? Yeah. The truth was really clear. Yeah. All right. We didn't know the story of slavery before. We didn't. We we never focused on the human price. We never focused on what a brutal institution it was. We never focused on how damaging it was to generations yeah. of Americans who helped build this land. And Roots put it in our face and, and made us look at it in a way through storytelling. And we were able to digest it. That was a moment of truth for America. Now, that moment of truth led to the election of Barack Obama as the president of the United States. And this now moment, this seeming backlash to Barack Obama's presidency and, and, and the sort of ephemeral nature of truth itself is really, it's confusing. And scary, I think. Very, very. I do believe everything happens for a reason, even when I'm, I cannot figure out what the <laughs> hell this is happening for. I just, I, tr I try and trust that in the fullness of time, all things will be revealed, and you just gotta hang in there. Yeah. And keep walking. The cooler heads will prevail. Yeah, right. but, you know, the other part of, of, of my, you know, you asked about, what, what are your, your guilty pleasures in terms of reading? Yeah, and yeah. I responded, I never feel guilty when I'm reading. Um, but I know, I get what your question was about. And for me, science fiction literature is where I go when I want to use literature as a way to escape uh, and entertain myself, as well as inspire myself. Um, and, and I just, I'm leaning heavily on my speculative fiction canon these days to keep 
my head up and to keep my aspirations high and to keep my vision broad and far reaching so that I don't get mired down in the in in the density of all of this yuckiness you know yeah yeah <clears throat> I think science fiction is great too because it can play with a lot of these relevant issues absolutely and does right yeah. It's easier to digest than uh -huh. reading some sort of fiery nonfiction novel right. that's going to raise your blood pressure and <laughs> yeah, give you a heart attack. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I've had you know I've had moments where I'm like I'm not built like some of these people. Yeah. I can't. I don't get a rise out of you know hmm. combative dynamics. Dynamics. Yeah. 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 Some people do. Some people feed off of it. You know? yeah. 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 I'm with you. I. I'm, I ain't one of them. But you might, I mean, most, a lot of readers are introverts. So yeah, we are. <laughs> it's, like, it's probably as far from, I mean, from. I feel like I can extrovert with the best of them, but you know what? If I can find some me time where uh, I can invite the world to leave me alone for a while, yeah. I'm good. good. Well, thank you so much Elizabeth. for talking with me. Oh. Wow, who thought that a conversation about books could get so deep into so many different things? Um, I've enjoyed it though. I've enjoyed Thank talking you. to you, it's too. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Books of Your Life is produced by me, Elizabeth, with Melissa Yeager-Miller, with production help from Craig Billmeyer and Studiopolis. Our theme was composed by Mia Schettino. If you've enjoyed the show, click over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you tune in, and please give us a five-star rating. It would mean a lot. Also, this podcast has its own book club on Goodreads, where you can connect with your fellow readers. We're discussing the books that LeVar Burton recommended, along with others from past guests, such as Anne Lamott and Sarah Jessica Parker. The group is called Books of Your Life with Elizabeth. Music